Good afternoon, and it's great to be here this afternoon with the Chief Executive Officer of the Education Department of South Australia, Rick Purse. Thanks for joining me, Rick, at this on, IPA uh, function, which or interview on the couch we do regularly. Uh, we've, we've had Jim McDowell and Dave Reynolds in the last couple of weeks, and today we've got got Rick Purse. Getting to the, the bottom of the barrel. Yeah, okay. <laughs> one of the, the um, people of the moment. So we'll, we'll get into some uh, questions sure. shortly and some questions from the audience as well as we've been doing. But firstly, I should acknowledge uh, that the land we meet on is the land of the Ghana people uh, and uh, acknowledge the uh, commitment from uh, elders past and present. Um, I'm Jamie Briggs. I'm the managing partner of uh, PwC uh, in Adelaide and, of course, an alumni with me yes, today of yeah, PwC. Yeah. So uh, no favouritism uh, and everything no, above board, no, of course. No. So it's, uh, it's great to have you, Rick. Mate, this is obviously, you know, a time which we've never seen before and education is front and centre of many people's lives. Um, those of us with children are dealing with the choices around whether we send children or not and, uh, yeah. uh, and you know, hurried decisions made um, in mid-March for many of us uh, and you're right at the, the top of that pyramid making these decisions. Where are we at today, four or day, five days away from um, school returning for term two? Sure. What, what are we thinking? What's the current state of the play? Well, um, we're pretty confident about term two, Jamie. I mean, the, the numbers, uh, infection numbers in South Australia, you know, three zeros in a row, um, are, are really good. <laughs> you know, there's just no other way of describing it. So, so um, compared to where we were in the last week before school holidays, where it was, you know, I'll be honest with you, it was pretty hectic. Mm. Um, we had some, you know, big numbers. Uh, we had the issue in the Barossa with a cluster and at uh, the airport. Um, whereas through the good work of the community and brilliant work of health and police and others, um, uh, the numbers are under control. And, you know, if we can keep those kind of numbers, then we're very confident about Term 2 starting quite strongly. The Premier's encouraging families to send their kids back to school. Um, uh, it's been proven out through the data and our work with health that um, that uh, schools are safe. Mm. The the settings from the the national uh, health body has been consistent all the way along. But you know we respected parents' choice. So mm. towards the end of term one, a lot of people were keeping their kids home, um, uh, and largely that was due to the uncertainty and so on. We respected all that. We moved really quickly about online learning, which worked out well. But we're thinking. Um, that uh, there's going to be a lot of parents and, frankly, a lot of kids who are going to be quite keen to get out of the house and come back to school. Yeah. School holidays haven't been very normal. No. Um, and, uh, you know, you've got kids, I've got kids. Learning from home, um, there's a bit of an art to it. Mm. And, um, you know, we think that we'll have um, more kids learning at school than learning at home and that'll build if we can keep the numbers in the excellent position that they are now. Yeah, and, and the the interesting element, I guess, that you're dealing with, and, and part of the national the national government response, and that seems to be consistent with what the prime minister and the chief medical officer at the federal level have been encouraging people yeah. to do as well. It does seem that if you look at the cluster element of the of the disease, that um, it is affecting particularly older adults in a more in a more serious way than when infections have, have yeah. hit schools, they don't, it doesn't seem to have had the same impact. You've had a couple of infections at schools, I think, but there's been no cluster element to that. Is that hard? Yeah, hard yeah. Hard yeah, no, look, that, that's right, Jamie. So, um, you know, we work uh, hand in glove with Nicola and her team on that. And, you know, I've got to give a shout out to our colleagues in health who've just done a brilliant job. Um, you know, we've had 10... Um, cases of a student, a, 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 you know, a kid between the age of five and 17 who have uh, caught COVID-19, 10 in South Australia, yeah. not public schools or schools. Mm -hmm. So, and nine of those were direct contacts with either someone coming back from overseas or someone who had the infection. Mm -hmm. So, so you're right, that, that kind of inter-school infection, where there's been one case where, um, a student was infected by a teacher. Mm. That was the case in Unley. Um, and no cases of students infecting a teacher and no cases of students infecting each other. So uh, 
so uh, I'm no epidemiologist, but you know those numbers in a pandemic are yeah. manageable, and the South Australian approach of of really getting on top of this contact tracing has been fantastic. So we, you know, as soon as this thing started to really get legs, we agreed a protocol with health that we were going to shut a school um, as soon as we had a positive student staff member. We didn't mind. As soon as it was, um, as soon as there was a positive, we closed it down. That did two things. One, we could do a deep clean. I mean, a serious clean. Uh, and the second is the health experts can do this contact tracing. So, um, so very, very quickly you could get on top of it, bench the people that needed to be benched into quarantine, yeah. and then get back to normal quite yeah. quickly. So, so that's worked out really well for us. Yeah, and that element of normal for for children and and their normal learning. Yeah. How important is that when you're thinking about? I mean, thinking about year eleven and twelves in particular. I mean, it's such an such a significant year in your yeah. life in year 12 and yeah. this is this is so disrupted there's so much stuff that you're not doing you're not yeah. being able to play sport go to parties with friends etc cetera, etc cetera. Yeah. how much is this element of normal important do you think for, for young people I think it's hugely important um, I think I think there's a kind of couple of different elements going on there so um, look, remote learning is is good and compared to no learning it's great but let's not pretend it's the same as specialist learning in the classroom with a professional yeah. educator with access to specialist facilities. Let's, that's, that's the gold standard. That's what we, we aim for. Um, and there'd be a lot of mums and dads and carers uh, who, uh, who've been um, supervising home learning who would have... a I'm sure they had a great appreciation for what their local teacher did. An increased appreciation yeah, an increased for the Increased appreciation. I know that's certainly the case uh, uh, amongst my circle of mates. So, um, so that's good. You, you, you're right about um, the year 12s, uh, year 11s and 12s. So we've worked really closely, and I should acknowledge the collaboration that's happened between the independent schools, the Catholic system, and us, and the SACE board. Mm -hmm. So Martin Westwell, who's the head of the SACE board, uh, has been in those conversations from the get-go, and we're, we're at one about trying to prioritise getting the Year 12s and the SACE students back. Mm. Um, you're right, it's a rite of passage, mate. It's mm. not something where you're meant to do your last year of school in your bedroom, yeah. staring into a laptop. Mm. So um, very, very confident that we'll be able to make great st uh, strides forward there. Uh, and that I know is um, is happening in other jurisdictions as well, even when their settings are a bit tighter than ours. Yeah, when I spoke to Jim a couple of weeks ago, from the premier and cabinet perspective, he's obviously involved in the national cabinet, which has been a unique development yeah. in the federation. Yeah. Um, and we reflected upon that and how quickly that had come come to pass. How's interested in from a public sector perspective? Perspective, your yeah. interactions with your colleagues in a state in similar positions, and also CEOs of different departments in, in, in South Australia, have you increased the amount of frequency with these discussions? Has there been changes in the way that you've gone about um, the, the yeah. collaboration? Yeah. Look, I think probably there's two, two answers to that. So on a national level, the, the, the camaraderie, the collaboration between heads of education around Australia has always been good mm. and then it kind of just went to this next level. The, uh, it shows, shows you the power of WhatsApp as well. Mm. So, you know, there's a WhatsApp group of heads of education and, and um, you know, the sharing of information. I mean, uh, you know, different jurisdictions are at different developments with their kind of remote learning strategies and so on. Um, units of work all just became public domain, mm. all free. Um, we did the same with our learning essay. Is um, you know put together this this incredible um, uh, resource, and obviously made it public um, because you know we're all we're all in this together. Yeah. We're all kind of Team Australia and then Team SA, and and no one's trying to point score off each other. Certainly in South Australia, I mean, that's why I love this state. You know we're we're at this beautiful scale where. Um, you know, we're, we're a big city, but not so big. Mm. Uh, we've got really strong regional hubs. Um, and the, 
the collaboration that ha happens all across um, uh, the South Australian public service has always been good in my view, but, but once again just for, finds another gear in the moment. Jim's been excellent as, as the head of it. Grant's always top shelf. Um, uh, Nicholas Spurrier has done a great job, Chris McGowan. But, you know, um, everyone's had their own challenges. I mean, you can, I, mean I, 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 I park in the same car park as, as um, Dave Reynolds and a few of the Treasury officials, and believe me, they are putting in some big hours at the moment. You can imagine yeah. the complexity of what they're trying to pull together in yeah. terms of business support packages, national negotiations. It's just been brilliant, um, and one you know one of the great efficiencies has been doing all this stuff electronically, because you don't have to go through all the theatre of, I mean, you've, you've previous life you know these things of ministerial councils yeah. and so on. Everyone has a turn to talk, and um, we admire the problem for a fair while. Whereas you know, uh, does it change? The, do you think this will long term impact, or will we? Get through the initial crisis and go back to normal, normal. Stuff. I think we'll, I think we'll drift back somewhere. But you know, I've sort of put a message out to my team just prior to Easter because you know they'd done, I don't know, forty days straight. They'd really been going at it hard, uh, and I wanted them to try and have Easter off. Um, but I put in that message that you know there was some silos that um, had been in our organisation for a long time, and they just immediately got smashed. And we can't let them build back up. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, in some ways, it was great because it was we were we were having to um, operate more in a consulting model. You know, we were organising around the opportunity or the problem or or the need, and and uh, resources were coming in from everywhere. And even things like, um, you know, we're we're a big show, as you know, Jamie, and uh, we've got you know, our main head office in Flinders Street, but another one at Hindmarsh. And so we gave up um, the, the uh, a whole floor of that building at Hindmarsh for health, for yeah. contact tracing. Yeah. It took three days. Mm. You know, that sort of stuff would normally have a working group yeah, and, sure. you know, six months yeah. of consultation and, you know, it just, it just moved really quickly and there's just been no complaining. Everyone's just um, got on the tools really quickly. I've had very senior people driving in their own cars, dropping off hand sanitizer to schools. Yeah. Because you do what you need to do. So, interesting, I mean, you mentioned you're the second biggest department in the in the public service in South Australia in terms of numbers of, of people. Yeah. With, you've got so many teachers who are, along with the health workers, front line of this and to a degree. They're, they're, oh, they're yeah, the people they're, we're they're asking right. to. Yeah. Um, how are you finding... Um, I mean, you know, it's one of these times when everyone seems to have turned into an epidemiologist and, yeah. and understand spread rates and yeah. aggregation Index models and so forth. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, so the teachers are under a lot of pressure and strain and yeah. parents have got different views about wanting children back at school or not at school or yeah. whatever it may be. How are you finding the communication with your teacher group who are so important and as you mentioned most of us are now working out just how skilled yeah, they are yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. at this time. There must be increased stress levels amongst the teacher group, how you find I that? Think, yeah, look, I think understandably um, people were responding to it differently. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the way we wanted to approach it was to, to not wildly throw out the models that had served us well, okay? So we worked through an architecture. As you know, Jamie, if, um, you know, if you're the principal of one of our big high schools, you're the... You're the you're the boss of that school and, and the teachers and the families and the kids are looking to you as the principal, not to, you know, the bureaucrat in Flinders Street. So, so we work through our local education teams, high trust and empowerment in our leaders, but we certainly had to dial up the support. And whether that meant just securing supply chains for them or setting up online learning materials and so on, huge amount of work around technology and enabling technology getting devices into the hands of kids and so on uh, has been really good. I think where we've um, been able to keep sort of calm and consistent with, with our all of our staff um, is that um, their safety and the safety of students and health of students has, has been priority. We've always been lockstep with health yeah okay i'm i'm not a health expert mm. but i know a lot 
And so I'll always defer to mm. science and the experts and the people who, mm. um, who have trained and are skilled in this area rather than me sort of reaching to the internet or Twitter for my, for my, my new fact base, you know? Like, let's stick with the people who know what they're talking about. Mm. And these are the very people who have architected the South Australian response in conjunction with the government and we are where we are, mm. and I'd rather be here than most places in the world. Which is interesting, we are, I mean, our results are incredible, and as you mentioned a couple of weeks ago, the, we had, you know, strong growth rates, it's been yeah. curtailed, we've had very few cases in the last few days, yeah. the last week or so, we could have very few active cases. By the time school goes back, essentially, yeah, we could have yeah. very few active cases in the state. How is your thinking um, turning as a government I guess more broadly rather yeah. than just in education to that switching back on element to an education plays a huge role to this piece too about getting people back to work if they've got children back at school kids are um, yeah. their, their parents are able to go back to work and so forth how, how do we start to switch back on in your mind and what would your observations be around that? well I think I think I think schools can be a really pivotal lever for kind of getting community back to normality. Um, but more important like that, more importantly than that is, this is, this is a kid's educational right. Yeah. Um, and it's suboptimal. It's yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. suboptimal doing it in any other setting than in a school or a preschool with professionals. So um, now, I mean, you watch the news every night and just shake your head about some of the narratives that's going around in other places um, about um, wildly flipping the switch between lockdown and wide open. And um, I have trust and confidence in our um, experts that they will have a strategy for easing this yeah. um, that is managed, manageable. So, and we will just abide by that. Um, Schools have been, you know, AHPPC has been, has never changed its mm. settings around schools and preschools, as you know, mm. uh, as, um, as very low risk environments. So um, as parents get a lot more comfortable, knowledgeable about the risk of transmission, yeah. those kids will come back. Um, that then will enable them to hopefully get back to work. But obviously there will be a whole pile of kind of decisions that get made outside of our remit in education. Sure, sure. We just need to be there for those kids. Yeah. And continuity of learning yeah. is, um, is absolutely pivotal. One thing that comes with school and, and learning is physical activity as well yeah. and, and, and school sports and you know, kids getting out and running around and playing footy or netball or yeah. whatever it is yeah. they've chosen. You know, community sports has been one of the victims so far of yeah, this. Um, yeah. Is that part of the thinking as well? I mean, at some stage, hoping that we can we can get kids not just back to school, but hopefully running around on Saturday mornings as well. Yeah, look, I'm I'm, I'm probably not the expert on that, but I know that the public health uh, officers are turning their mind to that. Um, look, I think we're a fair way off showdown and you yeah. know shoulder to shoulder at Adelaide yeah, Oval. Sure. Yeah watching the great Eddie Betts back where he belongs exactly. at the Carlton Football Club. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, we haven't lost for a while. Though. No, no. Lost, yeah. But, you know, getting kids out and about and active is, uh, is, is important. You know, we've got kids climbing the walls. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what yours are doing, but that's, yeah, you absolutely. know... Uh, we're, we're keen for them to, to uh, in our house, to, um, to run off a bit of uh, nervous energy. Um, Look, I think as soon as, as, as the experts decide that that's safe, that, um, that that'll quickly come back. Yeah. Um, but it'll be a bit different, you know, in the sense that, um, uh, you know, hygiene's going to be different. It, yeah. You know, it's, it's hard to say when things go back to normal, yeah, what's, what's yeah. normal. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think in a situation where, you know, if we can, if we can bank 20 days in a row of zero, and we've still got hard borders, then, you know, the, I know Chris McGowan and, and other uh, experts are, are, are recognising that challenge about how do you keep the balance? The community have been unbelievable in this state. Yeah. Um, and you only got to talk to Grant Stevens about um, having to sort of enforce some of those lockdown type situations in this state. There's been just such excellent levels of compliance yeah. um, compared to other to other places 
if we get zero after zero after zero after zero, people will understandably start going, okay, well, when can we start dialing this back a little yeah. bit? Um, so I know that um, I know that uh, the cabinet's turning the mind to that, and uh, and Nicola and her team are advising the premier. So just interested, and in, it's always hard to be too self-reflective. But you know, you've been you're a very experienced CEO now. You've been in the position for a number of years, and yeah. although at a relatively young age, I, I must say, hard. still. But the um, what have you? What do you feel like you've learnt in the last few weeks about managing in a crisis? And is it too early to, to be too reflective about that? I know you're someone who looks at this stuff quite yeah. deeply. How are you feeling about managing management style, issues? How, how have you felt it's gone in the last, last few weeks? I think, um, I think I've learned a lot about my own management style and, and leadership style, but, you know, I, I suppose... Uh, I'd, I'd put together a, a you know, pretty, pretty excellent leadership group in this department and they have just stood up and, and just grabbed this challenge. You know, some of, the, some of the things that have been achieved in days mm. that would normally take, you know, six weeks of business case writing mm. uh, have just been extraordinary. Um, so I think... You know, we, we certainly didn't wildly change what we were going after. We certainly had to move into this kind of... I called it stabilisation because we, we, had a, we had some really white-knuckle days there where, you know, we had to shut Henley High in the middle of a school day. Can you imagine it? Mm. Can you imagine, you know, 1,500 kids live-streaming an evacuation from a public high school um, on, their, on their iPhones? It was just brilliantly managed by Eddie, the principal there... We had some, some of the central people go down to help out. Just not a drama. Um, so, you know, if you create the space, the leaders will step into it. And so what I've tried to do is be very clear, very consistent. I, I declared myself um, uh, director of morale, so I tell the hilarious joke on our stand-up um, <laughs> teleconference every morning, which, uh, which people generally laugh at because they have to <laughs> That's right. um, uh, but look it's been it's been really good we had a we had a, a business continuity plan and we kind of rolled that in we've got people lots of people working from home some people working from the office I think the things for me the real learnings is the, is the criticality of communications yeah so I've got a brilliant uh, comms team and one person in particular who's who's moved into you know, my area on level nine. Uh, we have a coordination team uh, and one of my senior executive uh, team members, Ben Templey, has stepped in as my kind of 2IC for the moment because you know, we had to plan for the fact that we didn't know whether we were gonna yeah. start losing people out, yeah. out of the senior executive team and so on, but it's all been pretty smooth. Yeah, and how interesting that, that, that change in the way you're working as well. Yeah. I mean, um, talking to Jim, it probably wasn't as something that, you know, compared to some private sector companies and probably what you'd experienced in other places yeah. in the past as well, which were more advanced in, in remote working or capacity to, to work remotely. Yeah. The public service was probably a step back from that. Yeah. Um, uh, how have you found that sort of forced change? Has it, has it worked relatively well? Is there, again, things you'll do now do better um, from it? Oh, yeah, I, I think definitely. Um, uh, I saw a, a kind of meme the other day that said, you know, who led the biggest digital transformation in your organisation? It was CEO, CIO, COVID-19. Yeah. And it was, in our case, it was probably our CIO, Scott. But, uh, but yeah, it, 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 it's, I think that we have had great gains in, in uh, working virtually, which I was used to. Mm. you know 10 years ago in the mm. firm you know you would we would do this as a matter of course mm. um whereas i think the public sector and the ed, and certainly the department for education wasn't doing enough of that i think there's downsides though too jamie that you've got to pay attention to you know you can you see people that are working from home um getting a bit isolated themselves mm. a lot of people get their energy and mm. you know they spend huge hours working together and now they're stuck in their front room and yeah. um, they're not getting out and just having that by the by conversation. Yeah. So I think there'll be um, 
there will be gains, mm. but I, I, I think that we'll uh, we'll look forward to welcoming back yeah. um, no, uh, people. Do you know what I mean? Well, uh, and we look as you say, we've we've had a greater tradition of yeah. probably practicing some of these uh, working from home, but it's a once off, once a fortnight, occasional type yeah. thing. Whereas this is now. Yeah, we're, we're seeing very similar things. And, and I guess one of the issues we, we're very conscious of and we're working through, interested in, again, how you're thinking about this, is, is the mental health of, yeah. of, of staff. Because as you say, I mean, sometimes people who are going through some challenges find it refreshing to be able to have conversations in the workplace and so forth. Okay. You're seeing, I guess, that type of impact and how, how do you feel like the public service is addressing this? Well, I think the public service is, is, is very aware of it as a risk. I think... I mean, it's funny, you, I'm sure we've all seen it in our organisation. You've got some people who just kind of live for this stuff. They love it. Mm. You know, let me at the drama. I want to, I want to you know, be a, right in the thick of that. And that's great. And then there's other people that, um, that um, you know, are much more um, anxious about it. Um, and that's normally correlated to a real reason for that anxiety. That's the, they've got a vulnerability to their self. They're caring for someone that's vulnerable. Um, so we've had to be um, really kind of um, supportive and empathetic about different people's circumstances. Um, we've dialled up access to all of our EAP provision and so on. Um, but you know, if, if I if I I think if the situation dragged on for months and months and months, it's something that we'd really want to be proactive on yeah. because. Um, I mean, you just, you just, as I say, I do team meeting after team meeting, and you know, I can, I'm in my office, um, and you know, my EA's there, and I've still got a couple of people that I can have a chat to. Um, can't talk about the footy anymore, but. Uh, um, well, we can dream about it. We can, we can. Yeah. But uh, uh, I think I worry about those people that just might be a bit out of sight and out of mind. Mm. Um, and I'm going to look to my leadership group to make sure that they're really proactive about checking in mm. on that sort of stuff because, um, you know, work for a lot of people is a big, big part of it. hundred percent. Yeah, this is a big change very yeah. quickly. I might get through some of the questions yeah, sure. you've had sent in. Um, the first one is, um, what's the greatest takeaway of, or insight from the pandemic experience that could be used forward from an education perspective? I think from an education perspective... Um, I think that probably the biggest takeaway is that, you know, we focus on the continuity of learning. We focus on, you know, the learning's everything. Um, and we were doing that anyway. So we were being really deliberative about um, high expectations for kids, providing better curriculum support and so on for, for teachers and professional development. It's moments like, you know, a, a pandemic, not that I'd been through one, but um, that's impacted us like this. But it does kind of sort out the important from the not quite as important. Um, and uh, uh, I think the other thing is just how quickly you can adapt. Yeah. You know, we talk about agile and yeah. that sort of stuff. Yeah. You know, it, can move, it had to move from the kind of um, uh, the rhetorical to the concrete pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but anyway, it, it, it has. So uh, I think the downside for for some of our team is that um, is I, I know now what they're capable of under pressure. <laughs> so uh, probably mean we'll be even more demanding about. Time. That's right. So, <laughs> the ne- next couple of questions are, are similar themes, sure. to be honest, and they're, they're really in terms of traditional school learning that we've seen for yeah. however long and the new forms of online learning that we've yeah. been trialling in the last couple of weeks, will we receive return to the traditional form or is this the new normal, using some of the online tools more often versus is there a hybrid, I guess? In yeah, I think it's form? probably... I think hybrid's probably the best way to describe it. You know, as I said earlier on in my remarks, um, there's no substitute for a professional educator in a classroom full of engaged kids. Um, that said... Um, the the technology and then the access that we can provide kids, um, particularly kids in the country, yes, um, to provide them with the full suite of the curriculum, uh, with the the 
caliber of people and ideas that we can bring to the classroom or frankly to their home um, is, is staggering. Mm. The professional development we can provide for our educators and our leaders um, uh, is going to be uh, enabled even further through this. And I think, I think the efficiency of, of some of the corporate side of the business, um, uh, leveraging the technology will be, will be important. But I, I, I wouldn't want to lead anyone up the garden path that you know, we'll all be doing our units of work on our, mm. on our laptop and, and not talking to anyone else. That's, that's, that's not how it works, ideally. Back to uh, it's the topic we touched on earlier, and the, the last question from the audience at least comes from the, uh, the pandemic highlights the, importance, what, the important work of teachers. Will there yeah. be an increased demand for teachers as part of this recovery? Certainly in our household, we don't have any intention to be <laughs> teachers. No, not, not looking for a career change? No, no. Um, okay. Yeah, I enjoy the disciplinary part of the... Uh, oh, okay, right, okay. Well, the, uh, we'll, yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll, we'll leave that alone. But, but uh, I mean, more seriously, I, I think it has highlighted... Um, the challenge that, that educators find. And I guess one question as an adjunct to that, thinking that through is class sizes yeah. and so forth. Is that, again, is this something you think might change in the, I know it has big financial implications yeah, it does. and, yeah, it and does. big changes, but yeah. you know, that, these sorts of aspects of what does 2021, 2022 look like in the classroom? Is it different in your thinking than what 2020 was back in January? I think, I mean, I think the, I mean, back, back to the first half of the question in terms of demand for teachers, uh, you know, I get reminded of it every day. I'm in a super fortunate position where I get to go to schools and preschools a lot every week. And, um, and the skill and ability and agility of, of educators and the people who work in support of them and the principals. Mm. Principals get forgotten in this hugely. These, these are CEOs of... Mm. You know, pretty reasonable sized organisations, you know. They've, you know, you've got uh, big staff and 2,000 kids. You're running a fair, yeah. medium sized enterprise in South Australia. You're dealing with various issues, which oh, is you know, real, real complexity. Yeah. So, you know, our leaders and our preschool directors just brilliant. Mm. Um, I think that um, I think there could be uh, there could be an increase in uh, interest in the profession. Uh, one of the challenges for our demographic is that we've, we've, we're kind of swayed a bit towards the uh, aged end of the profile with our leaders. Uh, so I do worry, and we are paying a lot of attention over the next five years about you know, losing some very experienced, yeah. high quality uh, principals. So big effort for us is around pipeline. Um, absolutely. Um, look on the on the issue of of um, class sizes. This is a you know something that comes up a lot. You know I think I think that you know class sizes are what they are. Um, we're we're at a pretty consistent level in Australia, um, and uh, when you look at that across uh, the globe, there's some that are smaller and lots that are higher. And um, for me, it's all about the quality. Yeah. You know, so if we go after quality yeah. all the time, if we can, if we can provide the level of curriculum support, professional learning, um, technology, materials, uh, time and space for educators to collaborate with one another, yeah. then um, class sizes isn't going to be that big determinant, Jamie. It's mm. gonna, if I mean, you know what it's like. It doesn't matter what industry, and if you go and if you go hard after quality each time, you. You're generally going to be okay. Yeah. Um, Inter uh, in one thing that does, I think, and maybe it will impact in eastern states more than than it necessarily yeah. in Adelaide because of our demographics in a sense. But the, the presuming a, a longer term economic downturn, um, and there's you know there is yeah. a good chance that we will see quite an impact on on incomes for some sure. for for some years. Yeah. That will impact the family's capacity often to make choices about where they send children where they send them oh, to, school, to yeah. independent schools or do they use the public education system yeah when do you start talking to dave reynolds and the treasurer about <laughs> we might have five ten percent more kids next year than what we did just because of the financial circumstances that, that some parents are going to find themselves yeah. in? Oh, look i think it's a fair question and and we've already started some conversations with treasury about that um 
you know, the public system isn't uh, trying to use this as an opportunity, as a bit of a land grab for kids. Um, uh, uh, and frankly, you know, we would want to work in really close partnership with our um, sector heads in other education sectors to to support families who need a bit of interim help. Yeah. Um, because uh, because of their work circumstances, but um, but ultimately it's going to be a family's decision. Um, you know, people choose different school sectors for a variety of reasons, and that can be. Um, a, you know, faith or family, or that's where mum went to school, or, or dad went to school, or um, or uh, or fi could be financial as well. Um, so, you know, what our our ambition is is that you know we've got lots and lots and lots of great public schools, and we want every public school to be great, and we don't ever want anyone to think that they would choose against a public school based on quality yeah no for sure um so uh so yeah that's um that's our ambition and if there needs to be a bit of support that um uh the state does to be able to um you know help help people kind of smooth out that yeah. that economic shock so that they don't have to remove because it's super disruptive removing your uh -huh. kid from school yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think that um, they'd, the government would look at those options before, um, you know, building me a new half a dozen schools. We've already got three on the go at the moment, so yeah. uh, I, I, we do okay, money-wise. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, this is similar to what I asked Jim in the end, and, yeah. and hopefully flicks us to the positive. Uh, sure. I know you're a positive guy, you're yeah. a Carlton supporter, they are like good. I am, so you have to be positive. Be calm. <laughs> Try. The, the, what... Paint us the, the optimistic picture for for the state and for the uh, for the months ahead and for the public servants listening to this. With where, how does the twenty twenty end better than twenty twenty has begun? Oh, I'm 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 completely convinced that uh, things are going to get better from here. Um, uh, it's very hard to put. I know people want certainty. I, you know, I want to know when I can go to the showdown and yeah. what round the footy will start and and when will everything be back to normal well, well, we can't answer that but you know due to the you know there's some hard work and some sacrifices that people had to make uh, we're in a position that as I say I wouldn't swap it with anyone literally anyone so um, I think that I think there's some real positives already. One is, um, you know, as you know, I've worked for PwC and 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 spent a long time in the public sector in different different areas. Uh, I'm enjoying watching the public service at the moment. You know, it's a it's a it's an asset of of uh, this state and um, and the way it's responded is just makes me very proud to be part of it. Um, so, uh, but also, you know, never waste a good crisis. So uh, some of the things that we could do, I, I mean, I think I, I, I watched Jim's um, on the couch the other day and I, he was starting to talk about sort of sovereign capability and so on. I completely agree. Um, you know, we've got a real push for um, uh, vet pathways in South Australia. Um, uh, you know, imagine a scenario where South Australia and Australia is starting to, you know, rethink its own kind of capability with respect to manufacturing and, and so on, particularly um, using STEM and, and other things that we can be really helpful in, mm. the, in the pipeline for, yeah. for those kids into uh, vocational training or higher education. Huge opportunities. Huge opportunities uh, for South Australia, where if we can, um, if we can make the business case stack up, then we've got the kids. And um, the thought of keeping more of them in South Australia and and investing in our mm. pubs and clubs and restaurants and mm. Mm. and um, and retail would just be brilliant. So if we can be part of that, I'm super excited. Great. Thanks for chatting. Good on you, Jane. Thanks Good to see you, mate. And you too.